If you please take your copy of the scriptures this morning and turn with us over to Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. We're looking this morning at uh, Daniel chapter 9, and we're going to be looking again at verses 24 through 27. We began to investigate this passage last Sunday, and we looked at the people who were involved. Today we want to talk about the timing that is involved. If you found your place there in Daniel chapter 9, we'll be looking again at those last three verses there, verses 24 through 27 of Daniel chapter 9. And let's pause together for a word of prayer. Lord, open our eyes now and help us to trust God's timing. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. In many ways, the prophet Daniel is a lot like us. He helps us today with his guidance because he was troubled about the happenings in his nation. Are you troubled about the happenings in your nation? Here's what he knew. He knew that the future of his country was in jeopardy, and he was very concerned about that. Now, what makes that especially intriguing is that his homeland was once the greatest country in the world. You can demonstrate that from history. You can demonstrate that from your Old Testament. That Israel was at one time the greatest country in the world, but when Daniel was praying, it was at a very low point. Daniel was trying to discern the destiny of his people. And so, as I say, in many ways, Daniel is just like us. And God, in his infinite wisdom, takes us to his word, his infallible, inerrant word, and helps you and me to know, hey, we have a guide in these days. We have guidance that comes from the Holy Spirit of God working through men who, just like us, was concerned. He had passions. He confessed his sins, as we saw in an earlier message. He's just like us. And so when you and I are wrestling with that, I think what we're trying to figure out is, okay, how do we make the next right choices in the midst of a nation that is making a whole slew of wrong choices, how can we be part of the solution rather than part of the problem? How can we provide answers as God gives them to us? I think this really highlights one of the greatest privileges that we have as believers, that we can go to the word of God and we can gain wisdom, we can gain understanding. And there has never been a more important time for you and me to exercise the discernment that we have in the Word of God. And here is one of the most prominent things that we learn in all the Word of God. It is simply this. You can trust God's timing. You can trust God's timing. When you're wrestling right now with all the things that are happening... Could we begin there with the admonition to each other today as we are meeting together? And those of you who are online, the manuscript for this morning's message is there online. I would encourage you to go to our website and get that this morning. There are details that I will not be able to explain in detail in the message this morning. But I would encourage you to go back and really carefully read through those because what you'll see is this. You'll see it demonstrated that you really can trust God's timing. I think one of the great difficulties that we have is everything just seems to be so cloudy and foggy right now. And we just need for someone to clear the air. Back in April of 2020, there was a CNN travel article that mentioned the state of Punjab. That's a state in India. And they said for the first time in 30 years, the people who were there could see something that only their parents and grandparents had been able to see. Because you see, because of all the industry and the factories there in the area, the air had grown polluted. But with the pandemic shutdowns, suddenly they began to ask, hey, what is that off there in the distance? And if you're looking at it on the screen this morning, you can just barely see off in the distance 
you can see the snow-covered peaks of the Himalayas. Catch this, that's 100 miles away. Imagine what it would be like to be there this morning. If you and I would look down toward Dayton and see that rising up out of the sky there, that, that's what it would be like to be in Punjab. And the people were just astounded by this. When I read that article, I thought, you know, that's what we need in these days. It's as if the air pollution, the propaganda pollution is all around us, whether it's pandemics and politics or votes and vaccines or riots and reactions or mask and mayhem. <laughs> Here's the great need of the hour. The great need of the hour is we need scriptural guidance. We need for the Lord to clear the air. And as he does this morning, as he clears the air for us about what is going to happen in the future? Here is the admonition I think we walk away with. You can trust God's timing. Could you and I trust God's timing? I believe I'm like many of you in that I'm astounded by everything that just happened on the medical front and the way that absolutely interrupted the economies of the world and, and businesses were in upheaval and even governments were in upheaval and people are locked down and what on earth is happening here this much we know dear friends you and I can trust God's timing and that's especially important in today's text so as we look at this today let's go over to Daniel chapter 9 and notice what we find here pastor rod gave us a message from Daniel chapter 9 and verse 24 and this is really the purpose statement, if you will, in this passage. This is an especially fascinating verse because it tells us here is what God is going to accomplish in these 70 weeks. And as Pastor Rod explained to us, this is a reference to 490 years. They are not 490 consecutive years, but we do believe that there are 490 years, seven years that are just left in this prophecy. But during this time, just think about all the things that the Lord is going to do here. It says, these are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. This is a good reminder about the tribulation. What's the tribulation really about? I mean, what, what's it for, let's say? The great, the Daniel's 70th week, the seven year of trouble that's coming. What is the primary purpose of it? It is to bring the people of the nation of Israel, the Jewish people, it's to bring them to faith. And you can see that in passages such as Zechariah 12, Zechariah 13, the great revival that the Lord will bring when he pours out the spirit of grace and supplication. But just think about some of the things that he's, that he's going to accomplish as, as he does these things. It tells us that transgression will be finished. Boy, that'll be a blessing, won't it? That transgression will be completely finished. And that he will make an end of sins. Won't that be wonderful just to see the Lord take care of those kind of things. That he will finish the transgression. He will make an end of sins. What about the sins that are past? He will make reconciliation for iniquity. And here's the part I think most of us get very excited about, and that is he's going to bring in everlasting righteousness. Anybody want to say amen to that one? Wow, to see what the Lord is going to accomplish. Now, here's what the Lord is telling us about all this. He's saying that he is going to accomplish these things. This is the purpose statement. Next time somebody says to you as they read the newspaper and say, what is this world coming to? <laughs> Here would be a biblical answer. A biblical answer is, it's coming to a determined end, my friend, but then the Lord's going to bring a new heaven and a new earth. So the next time somebody says, what on earth, what's this world coming to? That would be a very biblical response to say it's coming to an end, a determined end that God has given us because when he uses the word determined here, it tells you about God's purposes of what he is actually accomplishing. All right, what are we learning just from that one verse? Okay, these 70 weeks, a reference to 490 years. God has a purpose statement. He's accomplishing these things. What do you walk away with from just that one verse? Here it is. You and I can trust God's timing. We, we can trust the fact that God is completely in control and he is going to demonstrate that for us. 
As he demonstrates it for us, go forward, if you would, to the next verses, in, beginning in verse 25. And here is what the angel says to Daniel. It says, know and understand, that's a good reminder for you and me, to carefully meditate on God's word. Look, folks, don't take my word for this. Please, don't, don't take my word for it. You need to study this for yourself. Anybody who stands in this pulpit or any other pulpit or anybody you watch on the internet or TV or whatever else, you need to ask, are they really speaking according to the scripture, according to the law and the prophets? If not, I'd turn my back on them. I would say, uh-uh. No, you got to show it to me in the Bible. So he says, know and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore, all right? Now that raises a question. The going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem, that raises a question for us in timing. When is that? Or now, to more than, more than 2,000 years later, when was that? When did the Lord actually accomplish that? He says, that from then until Messiah the Prince, well, we identified that last week as a reference to the Christ, the word Christos in your New Testament, Christ, that's a reference to the Messiah, unto the Messiah. And then he tells you it'll be these 69 weeks. He says it this way, he says seven weeks and then three score and two weeks. So you have seven weeks and then you have these 62 weeks that he's speaking of. And he says... And here's what's going to happen during that time. The street will be built again and the wall. You could translate that as the plaza and the bulwark will be rebuilt. Well, hey, that's one of the things that Daniel had been praying about. Lord, uh, when we return to the land, what's going to happen then? And the Lord is telling him, here's what's going to happen. That actually the city of Jerusalem will be rebuilt. We read about this now in the book of Nehemiah. The wall will be rebuilt. And here's what's going to happen then, he says, and even in these troubling times, it'll be rebuilt. But then don't miss this. It says, and Messiah shall be cut off. Now, that ought to just cause you to kind of put yourself in the sandals of Daniel just for a moment and say, what? What? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. The whole issue of the promised land, returning to the promised land, it's really about the promised Lord. It's about the Messiah who would come, the promised one. And so Daniel is asking here and praying and saying, oh, Lord, you know, please give me wisdom. And the Lord says, okay, here's what's going to happen. There's going to come a commandment to go back and restore Jerusalem. Yay, hey, this is really great. Not only that, the plaza and the wall will be built. Even in troubling times, there will be some difficulties and resistance. And then, glory to God, Messiah is going to come. You can just imagine how Daniel's heart was just leaping. <laughs> yes, all right, the promised one. Here's what we're trusting the Lord for. All the way from Genesis 3.15 to now, this is what we wanted to see. And then, he says that Messiah will be cut off. Then he says, Messiah will be cut off. Just imagine how Daniel's heart sank when he read about that. Now what you're seeing here in this passage then is a reference to the first coming of Jesus Christ. The first coming of Jesus Christ, he says, this is what is going to happen and this is how the Lord is going to take care of these things. This is what he is going to bring about. It was certainly surprising to Daniel. I hope to the degree that you and I today are able to put ourselves in Daniel's sandals. It's also surprising to us to think, yeah, why did the Lord do it the way that he did? You have three, three ideas here. First of all, there is this construction of the city. And Dr. Harold Hainer was a professor just really of great, uh, very great scholarship and just really wonderful help to all of us. And he's the one that talked about that. I was quoting a minute ago when I said, well, it's the, the plaza and the bulwark or the plaza and the walls. And he noted in 1975 that you could still see many of the, the foundation stones that they were talking about there. On a recent trip a year ago, uh, you sent us to Israel. Harriet and I were able to see those very stones. 
he's talking here about the construction, but then he goes on to talk about something else. He talks about uh, the Messiah who is going to come. Now, first of all, let's go back and just kind of think about it. When he says here about this commandment, there's going to come a commandment to restore. The question for all of us is, when did that happen? I mean, where, where can we find that in the scripture? And in the manuscript that I gave you this morning, I gave you four alternatives. There is, first of all, the decree of Cyrus. That's in 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verse 22. But if you read it carefully, here's what you realize, that when Cyrus came into power, the Medo-Persians, he came into power after the Babylonians, after the Chaldeans. What he sent them back to do was to build the temple. That's not exactly what Daniel heard prophesied. He heard more than just the temple being built. He heard the wall of the city being built. Then there was this decree of Darius. This came up in Ezra chapter 5. When the Israelites were there building, there were those who challenged them. The people of the land said, wait, 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 wait. You don't have the authority to do this. And so they sent a letter back to Darius and say, you need to know what these people are doing here. Darius went back and reread the decree that had been issued by Cyrus and basically said, no, they're doing exactly right. They're, they're doing what we told them. They had the permission to go and do, which was to build the temple. Then you have a third decree, uh, that first one, the second one was in Ezra chapter 5, verses 3 through 17. There's a third decree, and this is the decree of Artaxerxes. This is in Ezra chapter 7, verses 20 through 21. But again, when you read it carefully, it doesn't make any reference to rebuilding of the walls. Again, it is a reference to the temple. But there's one that you do know about, and you already know from your study of the Word of God, your reading of the Word of God, the book of Nehemiah. You know that the reason that Nehemiah was very upset, the reason he was just torn up in his soul in Nehemiah chapter 1 is because the walls of Jerusalem were still lying in rubble. You read about his prayer. Nehemiah chapter 1, you read his prayer. By the way, here's an interesting parallel. Read the prayer of Nehemiah in chapter 1, then go back and read this prayer in Daniel chapter 9, and you will see the similarities. You can see that Nehemiah was very familiar with what Daniel had written. In Nehemiah chapter 2, you find that indeed Artaxerxes did say to, to uh, Nehemiah, yes, you can go, and yes, you can go and rebuild. Okay, there we have it. There we have the launch point. There we have the moment that the commandment went forth to restore the, the walls of Jerusalem. And that's been estimated, for those who have studied this out, like Dr. Hainer, March, April of 444 B.C., now, here's what he's done. There was a man named Sir Robert Anderson who was actually in charge of Her Majesty's Secret Service in Britain who was fascinated by these kind of things. Here's what they went through and studied out and said, okay, you take this prophecy that from the time the commandment goes forth until Messiah, they mention here a very specific period of time. And Dr. Anderson, Dr. Hayner have done wonderful work for us. And I listed, I gave you a quote in your manuscript that I hope you'll go back and read where they recognized that the Jewish people were not working with 365 days in a year as you and I are today. They were working with 360 days. When they calculated it out and said, okay, let's take that. I mean, let's understand it in our time today in the way we would think about years. And they had to go through and say, wait a minute, there were some leap years in there and other things like that. They actually did those calculations, and here's what they came up with. That on March 30th of A.D. 33, I'm sorry, March of 30 or A.D. 33, that is when the triumphal entry of Jesus came into Jerusalem. It was at that point, you remember, even the children were talking about the son of David. He was exalted as the son of David. Now, what's the purpose behind what I just told you? It is this. You and I can trust God's timing. 
Read through that, especially those of you who enjoy math. Read through that quote. Get your calculator out, as I did, to say, these guys really know what they're talking about, and you're going to realize they really are right on target. And when the Lord gave that prophecy about from the time the commandment goes forth until he is exalted by some as the Messiah, it's exactly what he said it would be. It's, his timing is just perfect. But then it goes on to say, as you and I well know, that Messiah was cut off. You have these three ideas here then in this passage. First of all is the construction of the city that we talked about just now. And then the coming of the Savior, that is the Messiah. But then you also have that Messiah would be cut off. I think most of you and I are wrestling with this as we look into the scriptures and we see the way that Jesus Christ was crucified. Here were these Pharisees, here were these leaders. I was talking to someone the other day who said they've estimated that if you take all the Pharisees, Sadducees, Essenes, and a few other groups that would sort of be in the know, you're probably looking at about 10,000 men who were basically dominating what was going on in Israel. And those led the crowds to say, crucify him, crucify him. And they went on to say, we have no king but Caesar. We have no king but Caesar. Folks, think about what is happening in passages like that where the Christ, the promised one from the Old Testament, he's there, he is to be exalted. And what are the people saying? We have no king but Caesar. Be very, very careful that you do not reverse your loyalties and your faith and put more trust in the government and in politics than in our precious Lord. That's what the Pharisees were doing when they yelled, crucify him to the crowd. So during our own day of pandemics and political upheaval, I've had a very interesting opportunity to uh, call a number of pastors and say, hey, talk to me about how can we help you, what's going on in your congregation. If I've heard this word one time, I've heard it 25 times recently, the word is fear. There are people all over this nation and all over the world who are afraid. They are afraid of viruses, they are afraid of pandemics, they're afraid of contagion, they're afraid of political upheaval, there is fear all around. May I remind you that over in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 15, this was anticipated. And there the Lord said that people who all their lifetime, all their life long are in bondage to the fear of death. They're in bondage to the fear of death. Oh no, well, well, what if I die? But friend, then you realize this is part of God's plan to make reconciliation for iniquity, Daniel chapter 9 and verse 24. It's the very reason Christ came. It's the very reason he was crucified. He was crucified for the sins of mankind. He was crucified for our sins. He was buried. He rose again the third day. But don't forget, what's the significance of all of that? He conquered death. He arose again from the grave. Those who really do put their trust in him need not fear the grave. We need not fear death. You say, but yeah, but what if people start to threaten us with, with deadly violence? I mean, they, 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 they say, well, we're, we're going to kill you if you say these kind of things. I think part of our response has to be, excuse me, are you trying to threaten me with heaven? I mean, come on. I mean, let's think, think through this. Those of us who embrace Jesus Christ, the crucified one, the one who is risen again from the dead, we recognize that the Lord has been in charge of this all along. In John chapter 14, we talked about this a little bit in our panel discussion last week, that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And look, in a world where people say, well, there are many roads to heaven. I mean, there's, there's all kind of different religious roads to heaven. Here's what Jesus Christ said. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto God the Father but by me. 
You say, Pastor, that's, that's awfully narrow, isn't it? I mean, in a society that is a, a, a society of plurality, that's awfully narrow. It is narrow. It's about, it's about that narrow right there, okay? It, it's, about, it's about this narrow. In other words, are you and I really going to say what the Scripture says, or, or are we going to say what is popular? Jesus Christ said that he was the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. What are we learning in this message? Here it is. You and I can trust God's timing. This passage not only tells us about Christ, it also tells us about the Antichrist. You can see this over in the latter part of verse 26 and into the first part of verse 27. And it tells us about the people of the prince, the people of the prince that shall come. Now, when you think about the people of the prince and how they were conspiring together against the Lord, I think it's very helpful for you and me to keep something in mind. You have the Antichrist and you have his conspiracy. We're going to get into conspiracy theories here in just a moment. But before we do, let's give it a biblical framework, shall we, of how we ought to think through this. You find in Daniel chapter 9, the latter part of verse 26, these words, And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Wait, we were just told that Jerusalem was going to be rebuilt, the plaza and the walls. I mean, it's going to be rebuilt. Just imagine what went through Daniel's mind when he heard these words and he thought, Again? <laughs> Are you serious? And he, he's basically being told here that the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Pastor Rod and I uh, preached and taught on this, Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8. We understand the fourth kingdom there is the kingdom of Rome. And we understand when he says here, the prince of the people, he's talking about the Romans, all right? Question, did the Romans ever destroy the rebuilt city of Jerusalem? Answer from history, yes, 70 AD under Titus, they came in and just wiped it all out again. I mean, turned it all the way back to rubble. So when he says, the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, the really interesting note here is when he says, the people of the prince that shall come. In, in other words, he wasn't necessarily saying that it was the arrival of the Antichrist at that point in 70 AD. He said it was the people. This is what has led Pastor Rod and me to remind you that what the scripture is saying here is that the Antichrist is coming out of some sort of revived Roman Empire. You know, all the way back to Dr. Dunham and Pastor Snavely and others who have taught on this over the years. That's exactly what they've taught. And the reason is passages just like this, that in some sense, it's a revived Roman Empire. Now, by the way, when you think about the revived Roman Empire, just don't think about just Italy and the boot. What you really need to do is kind of go all the way around the Mediterranean and recognize the area that was actually dominated by the Roman Empire. But when you think about what's going to happen there, it says, the end shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war, desolations determined. Now, the reason I'm raising all this today is that I think we need to understand something about the Antichrist. And that is that the spirit of Antichrist is already at work. If you were not here last Sunday, and many of us weren't because of the weather conditions and road conditions, this is all online. Go back to last Sunday's message. I gave you a pretty elaborate list of the characteristics of the spirit of Antichrist and of the actual Antichrist. And what you learn in passages like 1 John chapter 4 and verse 3 is that Every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, that is, that he is the incarnate son of God, those are not of God. And John makes this comment. He says, that is the spirit of Antichrist, whereof you have heard that it should come. This is, I believe, exactly what's being anticipated in the word of God. Second Thessalonians, Paul talks about the fact that the mystery of iniquity is already at work And here's what we need to recognize. This is the giant conspiracy of Antichrist and the spirit of Antichrist against Christ. 
What that helps every one of us to do then is go back and say, all right, let's talk about conspiracy theories for a moment. I think many of you remember that, oh, 1995 and thereafter, this phrase was popularized, especially by Hillary Clinton. It was popularized that there is a vast right-wing conspiracy that was working against her husband and several others, a vast right-wing conspiracy. And I know many of us were scratching our heads saying, really, where, where? I mean, what do, what do we mean? Uh, one of my friends pointed out, he said, if it's vast, it's not a conspiracy. That's a pretty good way to, to look at that, you know, that, that, that it doesn't, it, it weren't just a few people who were in on it. They said it was a vast right-wing conspiracy. More recently, we've seen these conspiracy theories. There was the Trump-Russia conspiracy theory that Robert Mueller and others propounded. It turned out it was totally unfounded. I gave you an article there from The Nation magazine, not necessarily a conservative magazine, that demonstrated that those were completely unfounded. Most, most recently, you have the media, and they're really pumping this right now. They're publicizing the QAnon conspiracy theory, and that we ought to be very, very afraid of these people, you know, the QAnon conspiracy theory. I have to tell you, as I was reading this, I mean, the words of Elmer Fudd came to my mind. You say, Elmer Fudd, very, very scary. I mean, that's, that's the way that these people are are trying to say to others, hey, you ought to watch what's going on here and think about that. And the whole time what they're really propounding are these these conspiracy theories. You and I have to ask ourselves, is this what's going on? Look, this goes on. I mean, there are people who say, well, the, the politics, I mean, your politicians and your pharmaceutical firms, I mean, they're, they're all together. I have read some of the most inane articles recently about what people are saying about the vaccine. And look, if, you, if you'd like to sit down privately and just say, okay, I, I have concerns about the vaccine, I'm glad to talk to you about anything that I have read. And if you choose not to get the vaccine, I certainly understand that. I mean, how many of us buy a new model car in its first model year? You know, I would never buy a new model car in its first model. In the first place, I'm not going to buy a new car. I'm, okay, I'll just say that right out there. I'm going to buy a used car. But if I were buying a new car, am I going to buy the, the model in its first model year? And my answer is, no, I think I'll let other people work the bugs out. I might buy it in the second you know, or third year after that. I understand, and you can see this in the news, that there are a number of even medical professionals who are saying, you know, I'm a little hesitant about the vaccine. There's not a thing in the world wrong with that. I mean, I know there are people who are kind of pumping this. There's not a thing in the world that's wrong with this. But folks, there are people on television, on Christian radio stations and Christian TV stations, and, and I'm reading now, I shared with our men, I read an article the other day that was just... I mean, twisted logic where the vaccine is the mark of the beast and the antichrist and things like that. I thought, oh, Lord, help us here. Look, folks, you and I have to go back to the word of God, not to the speculations of people who, are they well-meaning? Okay, perhaps they're well-meaning people, but nevertheless, they are speculations about the things that they are saying. Some of the dangers here are very real, and the fact is that every single one of us needs to be able to work through these things. All right. Now, inevitably, there's going to be someone who would say to me, wait, 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 I can quote what the conspirators are saying. I, I can quote them, okay? Here's where I am on this, and just so you know, I think I've mentioned this before. I came here, uh, what I'm working on now, 27 years, I guess it'll be here before too long. I met one of the men in our congregation, dear brother who is now with the Lord, and he began to talk to me about these very things about conspiracy theories. What he didn't know is that right, right, shortly after I became a Christian, I became very conversant with a lot of these. I read from a particular bookstore. I read the articles. I read the books. I read them all when I was in high school. I actually wrote my English 102 paper about the Federal Reserve System based on some of those things. And, and when he realized that I was very conversant with those things, man, he was ready to adopt me as his son. And I thought, boy, this would be fun, you know, just to be, just to be his son. And he loved talking about these things. But I raised the very same question with him 27 years ago that I'm still raising today about whether or not we really believe these conspirators. 
Now, in your notes, and for those of you online, I think you might want to take a look at this quote. And for those of you here in the room, take a look at this quote that came from David Rockefeller. Okay, Rockefeller, in his 2003 memoirs, here's what he wrote, and I'm quoting here. For more than a century, ideological extremists at either end of the political spectrum, so he's talking about the far right and the the far left, have seized upon well-publicized incidents such as my encounter with Castro to attack the Rockefeller family for an inordinate influence they claim we wield over American political and economic institutions. They claim that we wield this kind of power. Now catch this. I mean, don't miss this, this next sentence. Some even believe that we are part of a secret cabal working against the best interest of the United States characterizing my family and me as internationalists and of conspiring with others around the world to build an integrated global political and economic structure, one world, if you will. If that is the charge, I stand guilty and I am proud of it. Now, I have to tell you, if I had read that kind of statement when I was in high school, I would have thought, there it is. I mean, there's the admission. There's the... But here's part of the question. Do you really believe that he had, now he's passed away at 102 years of age, do you really believe that he had that kind of power? Okay, the quote I think is, is, is true. I've seen it quoted over and over. I gave you uh, uh, the uh, footnotes there. You can go and you can check it out for yourself and see the exact quote. I don't doubt that he, that he said that. But the question you and I have to raise is, was he self-deceived? You say, well, I mean, he's admitting here that there's these, there's these super rich people and, and they're getting together and they're trying to control things. Okay, I'm right back to last Sunday morning's message, Jeremiah chapter 12. Here's what the Lord said. Here's what Jeremiah said to the Lord in Jeremiah chapter 12. He said, righteous are you, are you O Lord, but let me plead with you of your judgments. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why are they all happy that deal very treacherously? And look, you and I have seen illustrations in the news about this. I mean, there's the whole thing with Jeffrey Epstein and, and these filthy rich, super rich people. And, and they say they have this kind of power. Here's the question for all of us. Do you and I believe about them what they believe about our, themselves? Do you and I believe about them what they believe about themselves? Let me illustrate it this way. When I was in elementary, junior high, maybe even high school, I don't remember, I I would hear some tall tales at school and kids were talking about it. I was like, no kidding. And I would go home and I would repeat to my family and I'll be talking to dad, supper table, something like that. I would repeat this tall tale I had heard at school and my dad sat very quietly until I finished and then he would say this. He would say, and you believed it. Boy, I felt foolish every time he'd say that. And you believed it. <laughs> That's when I thought, you know, yeah, maybe, uh, yeah, yeah. And, and Dad would just kind of look at me. Folks, I have to tell you, with a lot of the modern things that are being said, the conspiracy theories that are out there, it's almost as if our Heavenly Father is looking down to us and saying, and you believe that? And you believe that? You'd say, <clears throat> look, I believe I can prove. Look, I, I'm telling you, I've read the books. I've read the stuff. You'd say, I believe these people are in league with Satan. Okay, you and I can go to the word of God. We can go to the book of the Revelation, and we find out that Antichrist is empowered by Satan. But when you read about the Antichrist in Daniel and Revelation, here's the question. Does he have the kind of power that people believe that he has? Okay, in the first place, you know that after seven years, we'll get to this in verse 27, you know that after seven years, it's like, I mean, it's done. I mean, it will not be more than seven years. But even during that time, if you read the book of the Revelation carefully, you realize even the Antichrist can't hold it all together. I mean, he's, he's moving, I mean, he's got things going, and all of a sudden he hears this news out of the east and out of the north and says, oh, no. Folks, don't we have to admit that a lot of times trying to work with human beings is like herding cats? Don't we have to admit that? You say, boy, is that ever true? 
then why would we think that these people have the kind of power that they have? Especially when you and I can go to a passage like Daniel chapter 4 and verse 17, what Daniel said to Nebuchadnezzar, that the living may know that the most high God reigns in the kingdom of men and he appoints over it whomever he will, even the basest, even the lowliest of men. Let me go back and say what I said a minute ago. I'm stunned by the events of this world about what happened with the pandemic and the upheaval and the business and the politics and like, what? I mean, mean, look at all these things. Folks, what if that's all part of the most high God ruling and reigning in the kingdom of men and he's bringing about the purposes that, he, that you find there in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 24 because, hint, hint, he is. I mean, he is bringing all that about. In his wonderful crucifixion for us, he made reconciliation for sin and he's ushering in everlasting righteousness. Aren't we many times lately like Peter walking on the waves and we take our eyes off the Lord and we start looking at the waves and that's when our fear kicks in. That's when our worries kick in. That's when like, you know, oh no, I mean, what's going to happen here next? 2 Thessalonians 2 makes it very plain that even in Paul's day, the mystery of iniquity or the mystery of lawlessness was already at work. You say, but, but pastor, I mean, these people, these, these super rich people and the cabal, I mean, they're all together. I mean, they're, look what they're trying to do. Okay, okay, okay. Does that mean then that we are supposed to wrestle with flesh and blood? Because my Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Look, folks, here I think is the greatest danger of all. You may say, those people have real power. You have not stopped to think about the power you have before the throne of God. You have not stopped to think about the embrace you have, the access you have, how that the simplest prayer of the smallest believing child can overturn so many things by the power of the Most High God. Folks, let's not get all caught up in political conspiracies. What we ought to be doing is is praying and crying out to God for his great work. You and I can see this as we look at the scripture and understand what the Lord is accomplishing here. In just a few minutes, we're going to sing from Psalm 2. If you wanted to give another biblical framework for all the conspiracy theories, please begin with Psalm 2. That the kings of the rulers of the earth have set themselves against the Lord and against his anointed. And what does it tell you in Psalm 2? It says, he that sits in the heavens shall laugh them to scorn. He will laugh them to scorn derision. Folks, I mean, think about what this means, that the Lord laughs, he mocks these puny, pompous potentates who believe they have all kinds of power. Not in the face of the Most High God, they don't. And you and I have the opportunity to go before the Lord and to cry out to him and unite our voices in singing from Psalm 2 here in just a few minutes that we can glorify the Lord, that the most high God rules in the kingdoms of men. When you see what you find here in Daniel chapter 9, the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city. We We know that Jerusalem was destroyed. We know the desolations are going to come. Here's what you find in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. Now, pay really close attention to this because there was a, a prophetic speaker who spoke here at Calvary long before I got here, but I heard some of his tapes and he got this exactly right. Here's what most people get exactly wrong. He got it exactly right. Question, when does Daniel's 70th week, sometimes called the period of tribulation, by the way, depending on who you read, there, are, there I think most people say, okay, the seven years is the time of tribulation Some authors will say, I think the last three and a half years is the time of great tribulation. Okay, it's a a fair, it's a fair description, it's a fair statement. But here's the question. 
When does that last week, that last period of seven years, when does it commence? Here's the answer. It's right here in front of us on the screen. When he shall confirm the covenant, that's a treaty, with many for one week. It's a seven-year, apparently a seven-year treaty. Here's what many people say. I believe the seven-year tribulation begins with the rapture. Answer, not according to this passage. According to this passage, it's a treaty or a covenant that is being made here apparently with Israel. Now, pay really close attention to this because this has been much in the news recently. Have you noticed the number of treaties that are being made with Israel recently by some really amazing players, I mean, that are Arabic players, and they're making these treaties and these covenants with Israel? You say, what are you trying to say, Pastor? I am trying to say, look up your redemption draws nigh. The fact is, we could be right on the cusp of this thing. I mean, this thing could begin any day now. You say, are you predicting that the tribulation will begin very shortly? I'm not doing that. What I am doing is showing you what the scripture is actually talking to us about, that there are some pretty remarkable parallels. Uh, one of my uh, teachers described this as there are waves of this. I can see why that the people during World War II, I can see why that they said, you know what, Hitler's a lot like the Antichrist. I could see why they would have said that about Napoleon. I, I can see why they would have said that about even some Roman emperors and even popes. I can understand why they would say that. And so I'm not now saying, look over there, there he is, that man's the Antichrist, this person's the Antichrist. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. I'm just simply pointing out that there have been a number of treaties made recently with the nation of Israel that I found rather surprising. Haven't you? It tells us during that period that in the midst of the week, and we understand from other passages, this is three and a half years in, he will cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. It's passages like this that tell us that the temple will be rebuilt and that he is going to stop this. In fact, he's going to exalt himself as God in the temple. And the overspreading, the way it's translated in the Hebrews here, Hebrew is on, on the wings of abominations. I mean, it's like, it's like this thing is flying. The, the wings of abominations, it will spread so fast and so furiously. That's the kind of thing that is being described here. So here's the question for all of us. What's going to be the end of this? What's going to be the end of this? If you missed everything else in this message, do not miss what you find here in the end of verse 27, because I think it's so very important for us. First of all, when you read in your scriptures, depending on which translation you have, notice that the last word there in some translations, the last word of Daniel chapter 9 is the word desolate. That word is a masculine singular I would hope that you would even make this note in your Bibles here that it, when it says the desolate, it's speaking of the desolate door. It is speaking specifically of the Antichrist. All right? What will be the end of all these things? Look at it there on Daniel chapter 9. I've got it on the screen for you. He, this is Christ, he shall make desolate, I'm sorry, that's the Antichrist. He shall make desolate even until the consummation. All right, what's the consummation? Here it is. It is the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, in that passage, that message that Pastor Rod gave us, he took Daniel 9, 24, and he unpacked it all the way to the end. And here you're seeing it. This is exactly what's happening. That what the Lord is going to do is he's going to usher in everlasting righteousness, right? You say, wow, man, this is getting pretty exciting. It is getting pretty exciting. It's the most important time we've ever seen to say, are we really trusting in Jesus Christ? Don't miss this, that he has determined. You say, what should we pick up from that one word? You and I can trust God's timing. I mean, that's what it comes down to. Can we go back and see, wow. I mean, he said from the moment that he issued the commandment, that the commandment went forth until the triumphal entry. Wow, that was, that was exactly the amount of time the Lord said it. And by the way, the Messiah was cut off, all right? 
can we then take what we know there and apply it ahead and say, wow, here's what's getting ready to happen, the consummation. Folks, wouldn't it be something right now if you and I are less than seven years away from the second coming of Jesus Christ? Wouldn't that be something? Wouldn't that be a time to say, glory to God? Now, look, look, we're like schizophrenics here, right? We're like schizophrenics. We look at all these things in the tribulation and all, and all the things that are going on there and we're going, oh, no, no, oh, I mean, I mean, look at all the bad stuff that's getting ready to happen. Okay, and here's where we're schizo. And it's like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, hey, 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 Jesus Christ is coming back. You and I have to ask ourselves, where are we going to dwell? Are we going to be like Peter watching the waves or are we going to be like Peter with his eyes on Jesus Christ? The appeal then this morning, I think, is very simple. That is, will you trust in God's timing? In this passage, we have seen how God has fulfilled his prophecies. He is fulfilling his prophecies. He is going to bring in everlasting righteousness. This brings it right down to every single one of us sitting in this room and every one of you online this morning. It brings it down to you as an individual. Are you really trusting Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? I made this comment last week. If you are not trusting Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you're already trusting in the spirit of Antichrist. It's time to repent of that. It's time to confess your sins and embrace Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and say, wait a minute. It says in 2 Thessalonians, he's going to send a strong delusion, and we believe that's right after the rapture. If you see this morning in the light of God's word, you see how important it is that right now is the time to trust Jesus Christ. If nobody's ever said this to you before, do you not recognize you are personally responsible to cry out to Jesus Christ, to confess your sins, to repent of those sins, and cry out and say, Lord, save me, and he will. Whoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then, my friends, I'm asking you, could we not trust God's timing? Shall we bow our heads together? Lord, we are so grateful to you for the way that your word clears the air for all of us in all the, the air pollution that could just cloud our vision of pandemics and politics and vaccines and all the other things that are going on right now. Oh, dear Lord, Help us to trust your words and recognize that the most high God rules in the kingdom of men. And now, Lord, I'm asking for every single person under the sound of my voice that they would bow the knees of their heart, that they would confess Jesus Christ as Lord, that they would turn and trust him before it is eternally too late. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.